Metabolism is often presented as this kind of neat little pathway where you take glucose and you go through glycolysis and you break it down into pyruvate and then you take that through the citric acid cycle and then you take that through the electron transport chain and boom, you've got a bunch of ATP. But what I'm going to try to convince you today is that really things are a lot more complicated than that, but they make a lot of sense. So what I mean is that although metabolism contains all sorts of different pathways and they're all interconnected, we have the pathways of fat breakdown and fat building, of sugar breakdown and sugar building, amino acid breakdown and amino acid building, nucleic acid breakdown and nucleic acid building. All of these pathways are going to be interconnected. And one of the central kind of like hubs where they all come together is the tricarboxylic acid cycle. This is sometimes called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, and we're going to look into it in more detail later. The key thing about the tricarboxylic acid cycle is that it's used as both catabolic, so for breaking things down, as well as anabolic, so making molecules. And in order to keep making molecules, if we take things out of the pathway, well, then we also have to have ways to put things into the pathway. And this introduces the idea of anaplerotic reactions, reactions that are gener regenerate the pathway intermediates. So we'll see how we can do things like take amino acids um, and break them down to get into the pathway, take fats and break them down to get to the into the pathway, but then also take things out of the pathway to make those. So all of this is, of course, going to be tightly regulated, and so we'll also get a little into the regulatory points of these pathways. So this pathway, this tricarboxylic acid cycle, is really the central kind of like coordinating hub. It's great, yes, for that catabolism when you want to break things down, because ultimately it's those um, electrons that we're passing down that we're getting from our NADH, from our FADH2, that are then going to give us the big ATP payout. But sometimes that ATP payout isn't what we're caring about. So the tricarboxylic acid cycle, yes, it is a way for us to get convert all of those different energy sources into the um, electrons that we can use to make ATP, but there's so much more that we can do with it. And so let's discuss it further. First off, why might you want to have these small little pieces? We break down our, we start in glycolysis, we start with this molecule of glucose, where we have these six carbons. And then at the end of glycolysis, we have this three carbon compound, this pyruvate. And then in order to even get it into the cycle, we're going to break it down even further to this two carbon molecule, acetyl-CoA. Well, I mean, at least the acetyl part has two carbons. The purpose of kind of breaking things up into these smaller parts is now we have these sorts of reusable parts where we can take small parts from big molecules and combine them together in different ways. So we can take acetyl-CoA that we get from sugar, or we can take acetyl-CoA that we get from things like fat. We can take, um, and we can take these smaller molecules and go use them to make bigger molecules. So it really does make sense that we break things down and then use these smaller pieces. So even in glycolysis, we saw that we were breaking down this glucose into two parts, and then we were treating these parts, these two identical parts, but the, we're dealing with these smaller pieces, and so now we need to have fewer enzymes as well, because there's less variations that you could have with a molecule that's smaller than if you had a molecule that was bigger, and then maybe you had to have an enzyme that recognized each different variation. But by having these smaller pieces, there's fewer variations, and it's easier to form them from a bunch of different molecules. So let's talk about how we can do this forming and look at the logic of the TCA, as well as in the context of metabolism overall. First, let's get an idea about where things are happening and orient ourselves. So when we talk about metabolism, a lot of it's going to be happening in the mitochondria, and some of it's going to be happening in the cytoplasm. When we talk about glycolysis, that's happening in the cytoplasm. When we talk about the citric acid cycle, that's happening in the mitochondrial matrix. Most of it is just happening in the matrix, so this inner membrane, this inner kind of like chamber. But then there's also going to be the succinate dehydrogenase step, which is actually embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane. And that complex is actually part of our electron transport chain, that's going to be complex two in the electron transport chain. 
and it's going to contain, that's going to be the step where we're actually generating the FADH2. That's one of the um, flavin, so it, the FADH2 is tightly held inside the protein complex. And so it's not soluble. Um, it's got to be stuck in the membrane. And so we want it to be stuck in the membrane where we want it. So our succinate dehydrogenase is going to be in the membrane, in that inner membrane space. But the rest of things are going to be happening in the matrix. As I mentioned, however, glycolysis is happening in the cytoplasm. So when we're generating this pyruvate through glycolysis, that's going to be in the cytoplasm, and it needs a way to both get into the mitochondria and into the tri and into the tricarboxylic acid pathway. In order to get into the tricarboxylic acid pathway, well, we need to it to be two carbons. The whole idea of the tricarboxylic acid cycle is that we take this two-carbon compound, acetyl-CoA, or the acetyl part of acetyl-CoA, and then we combine it with oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate has four carbons. Two carbons plus four carbons is six carbons. We join these together, we get the six carbon citrate. Then we lose two carbons in the form of CO2. So in two different steps, we're going to lose one carbon dioxide. We're gonna lose another carbon dioxide. So we go from that six carbon compound back to a four com carbon compound, which we regenerate to form this another oxaloacetate. And therefore, when we add another acetyl-CoA, we can continue on the cycle. Each turn of the cycle, we're getting three NADH, one FADH2, and one GTP. And this is, um, if we were doing this from glucose, we'd be doing this cycle two times because we'd have two acetyl-CoAs because we had two pyruvates. But how do we get from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA? In order to do that, what we have to do is we have to oxidatively decarboxylate it. If we look at pyruvate, it's what we call an alpha keto acid. So it has this carboxylic acid group, alpha to a carbonyl. So it's next to it, it's alpha. Just like when we talked about alpha amino acids, where they had like the amino group and the, um, and the acid group right next to a carbonyl, that's the same sort of thing. We have an alpha keto acid. acid. In this case, we have pyruvate. Alpha keto acids, if we want to decarboxylate them, that's going to be tricky. So we're going to have to go through some tricks and we have to use these complex enzymes. These big, um, these big complex enzymes we'll get into a little bit, but basically they're going to use the cofactor TPP, lipoate, FAD, they're going to take NAD plus because remember we're doing oxidative decarboxylation. So not only are we de decarboxylating this, um, but we're also going to be oxidizing this carbon. So normally when we think about oxygen we're th or oxidation, we're thinking about like, oh, you form a bond to an oxygen or something like that. Well, a bond to a sulfur is also going to be a form of oxidation because sulfur is going to be more electronegative than carbon. So if you were to break this bond, the, the electrons would get to go with the sulfur rather than with the carbon. So we say that carbon has been oxidized. And speaking of going with the sulfur and breaking the bond, these bonds are going to be easier to break when you have a bond to a sulfur. These bonds are easier to break than a, break, than a bond to an oxygen. So if you make a sulfur linkage to something, that's going to make it so that you can kind of have a swappage point. And so this is what we're doing when we're forming this acetyl-CoA. Not only are we decarboxylating it, but we're also going to be kind of introducing a handle onto it. This handle is kind of like, it's going to make it easier to break. This point is going to be make it easier to attack this carbonyl carbon and do things with it. It's gonna be easier to attach this to another molecule. And it's also going to make it so we kind of have stored energy in this bond. In terms of what acetyl-CoA, what CoA actually is, is it's this kind of biggish molecule. When you see like CoA, it might sound like, oh, it's just a couple letters. You know, it's probably this small little thing, but it's actually kind of this big bulky thing. It's derived from vitamin B5 or pantothenate. And you have basically the business end of it is going to be right here where you have this sulfur that can form these thioester linkages. So in acetyl-CoA, this is our acetyl group and it's on the CoA. Just a technical note that sometimes you'll see CoAs or like CoAsH. 
basically that's just referring to the sulfur on the CoA. So it's part of the CoA. So it's not like there's an extra S on it. It's just referring, it's just emphasizing that there is that sulfur that's going to form those important um, reactive links that's going to allow you to make these thioester linkages. And these linkages, remember, are kind of like our handoff points, our swappage points. So by putting an acetyl-CoA on something or by putting a CoA on something, we're able to have this point where we can swap things out, this point where we're able to make carbon-carbon bonds because making carbon-carbon bonds is often pretty tricky. But by putting an acetyl, um, by putting a CoA group on it, well, now we have a way to do that. And remember though, that this acetyl-CoA group, this CoA group is going to be kind of big and bulky we're not going to want to transport it through the mitochondrial membrane. Instead, what we're going to want to do is we're going to add it once we're already in the mitochondrial matrix. So our acetyl-CoA is going to be formed in the matrix. We're going to make that pyruvate in the cytoplasm. Then we're going to take that pyruvate into the mitochondrial matrix, and there we're going to carry out our, um, de our oxidative decarboxylation. This oxidative decarboxylation, it removes a carbon dioxide, it gives us an NADH, which we can later cash in, and it's going to give us our acetyl-CoA. Note too that we're making this NADH in the matrix itself, so it gets to go through complex one, and we're therefore going to get the full energy yield from it. The N this is opposed to the NADH that we make out in the cytoplasm with glycolysis, where then if we, depending on what shuttle we used, we may have it enter at complex one or we may have it enter at complex two because that NADH can't get into the mitochondria and has to take a shuttle. If it takes the glucose, um, the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle, it has to come in at complex two. But if it takes the malate aspartate shuttle, it comes in at complex one and more about that in the other video. But for now, let's get back to our story of our tricarboxylic acid cycle. Let's get back to the idea of kind of like, well, what are, what are what's actually going on in this cycle? First off, the name. So the citric acid cycle, well, that makes sense because we've got citrate. So remember citrate, that's going to be the six carbon compound that we form when we join an acetyl -co the, co the acetyl group from acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate. When we're doing this, we're releasing the CoA. And remember that CoA, we had that reactive thioester group that's going to make it so that this is easy to break and form a bond to carbon. And so that's what we're going to do. We're combining these to form our citrate. This is a tricarboxylic acid. So we've got these three carbon dioxide groups, one, two, and three. We're going to lose this one, and we're going to lose this one. And both of these are actually going to be coming from the oxaloacetate and not from the acetyl-CoA. So as we'll discuss, to actually get rid of the carbons from this acetyl-CoA, we're gonna have to go through two more cycles. But let's get back to our story. Where we're starting this pathway, we have this citrate formation. This is going to take place with the help of an enzyme called citrate synthase, which is going to be one of our regulated steps. When we do this step, as you might expect, since we're breaking off that CoA, we're going to be getting a, um, this is going to have a nice negative delta G. This is going to be energetically favorable, and we're also going to want to regulate it tightly. But when we join those together, we get our citrate, we get our six carbon molecule. Now we're going to take an enzyme called aconitase. And aconitase, what it's going to do is it's kind of just going to switch the position of this OH group, this alcohol group. So remember that we have this carbon dioxide here and we have this carbon dioxide here. We want to basically get this into a form where it's going to be easy to lose a carbon dioxide. And we talked before about how if we had an alpha keto acid, that was going to be hard to get rid of. And we'd have to go through one of those complexes where we used um, all those complicated tricks like our pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. We had this big multi-subunit -complex, multi complex where we had all these cofactors. And I'm not going to go into the mechanism, but basically you're swapping off, you're getting rid of the py pyruvate is going to then get attached to this enzyme. And then that's going to get passed off from place to place within this enzyme ultimately generating NADH and our acetyl-CoA. 
we can go through a similar um, situation to to do the oxidative decarboxylation of other alpha keto acids. But if we can change something out of being an alpha keto acid to being a beta keto acid, that would be favorable for reasons we'll get into in a second. If we look at citrate and we look at isocitrate, what we have here is we have this OH group on the central carbon, and here we have the OH group right here. If what we do is we were to oxidize this hydroxyl group, what we would end up with is that we would have a beta keto acid. It would be alpha beta to this carboxylic acid, and then that would be easier to lose. Let me show you a little more explicitly what I mean. So with our isocitrate, we had set things up so that we had this oxygen here. When we have this oxygen here, basically what we've done is we've went from the case where we had a, we went from having basically this tertiary alcohol, which is gonna be harder to oxidize, to having this secondary alcohol, which is going to be easier to oxidize. When we oxidize it, now we end up with having this beta keto acid. And as I mentioned, beta keto um, decarboxylation of a beta keto acid is favorable. Why is this? Well, if we think about what happens to happen in order to decarboxylate, remember that our carbon dioxide is CO2. If we have these oxygens flow back onto to form a double bond with this carbon, that kicks these electrons off. These electrons then get pushed onto forming a double bond with this carbon, which forms an enol um, or an enolate in this case, because we don't have a hydrogen right here. But basically we have this enol group and we get that enol keto tautomerization, that same thing that we saw in the case of our phosphoenol pyruvate going to pyruvate, we saw that was going to be really, really favorable because we got that enol keto um, tautomerization. Remember that the oxygen would much rather have electrons than the carbon. So if you're able to go from an enol form to a keto form, that transition is going to be energetically favorable. In the case of our um, this decarboxylation, what we're doing is we're going, we're taking this and we're forming this enol or this enolate, and then we're going to unform it. So we're going to basically go back to the keto form to give us alpha ketoglutarate. Having that transition, that enol ta um, keto tautomerization is then going to make this very energetically favorable. And so in the enzyme um, active site, it's able to help coordinate things make it so that you have this um, manganese that's going to be helping all the, this out and you're going to get this highly favorable interaction where you get this oxidative decarboxylation. And going back to how we set the scene for this, first we took our citrate and we made our isocitrate. What we did here was we were changing the position of this, this alcohol group. By doing this, we went from a tertiary alcohol, which would be hard to oxidize, to a secondary alcohol, which would be easier to oxidize. Additionally, this set us up so that when we did oxidize it, we would end up with a beta keto acid because we would have this, this carboxylic acid group um, be alpha beta to a ketone. Now what we could do is we would do that oxidation and we would do that decarboxylation and that was happening, all happening by this isocitrate dehydrogenase. So that was happening in between our isocitrate and our alpha ketoglutarate. We don't see that intermediate we just talked about, um, this oxalosesinate, because it's going to be highly unstable. And so we're not actually going to see that in the in our tricarboxylic acid pa pathway, but it is an important point, part of this mechanism. So what's going to happen next is we want to get rid of another CO2 group. So we got rid of the CO2 group, which was coming from our original oxaloacetate. Now we're going to get rid of the second CO2 group, which was also coming from our oxaloacetate. We'll get into this in a minute, but basically at this point, the, the enzymes that are responsible can treat, can tell that the ones at the top, that these two came from our acetyl-CoA and that these ones came from our oxaloacetate. Basically, when you have the citrate synthase reaction, this is kind of held in the enzyme active site so that it can only attack from one face and therefore the enzyme knows like, yeah, those ones on the top, they came from the acetyl-CoA and the ones on the bottom, they came from oxaloacetate. 
So if you say it had a tracer on one of these carbons, you'd be able to tell them apart and you'd be able to tell that it's going to be the second cycle when you're actually going to start losing them. So what's going to happen next though? We need to actually lose that second carbon dioxide. And if we look now, well, now we have another alpha keto acid. And if we have an alpha keto acid, we can't do that simple keto -edo, um, edo, enol keto tautomerization trick we used before. Instead, we have to go back to resorting to those complicated gymnastics that we used in the case of our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. You can do similar, there are similar enzymes that will do this oxidative decarboxylation of various sorts of alpha keto acids. We'll see that we can do things like um, break down branch chain amino acids. These alpha keto acids of that, we can break down using a similar mechanism, um, using a branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex. Basically, it's going to be another one of those big complicated things. And here you can see that we have this E1, E2, and E3, which is actually very similar to what we had in the case of our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, where we had our E1, our E2, and our E3. E1 is the only one that's actually, this is the one that actually binds to the substrate. E2 and E3, these are kind of just where they're passing things around and doing the reduction reactions. Um, the oxidation reduction reactions. And it turns out that E2 and E3 can actually be shared between different complexes, whereas the E1 will be specific for your substrate. E2 and E3 can actually um, be used for the same sorts of things. And so we see the same machinery kind of reused in different forms. So we can take this alpha ketoglutarate and make sustenyl-CoA, or you take pyruvate dehydrogenase and make acetyl-CoA, these are going to use very similar mechanisms where we're using that um, TPP dependent enzyme. It had that like lipoic like acid. It had used NADH. Um, it used acetyl, it used CoA. We give it a CO2, the same sorts of gymnastics. Really cool stuff, but I don't have time to get into it. But that is going to be how we're going to do that second decarboxylation. And so again, we're going to be generating an NADH. And we've attached another CoA back on. So now we have succinyl-CoA. So we had CoA kind of come and attack where this carbonyl carbon is and push off the CO2. So we've lost the CO2, and this is an oxidation because remember that we have a sulfur group that's adding to this carbon. Sulfur is more electronegative than carbon, and so this is going to be an oxidation reaction. We have this um, this th reactive thioester that's going to make it easy to break off this CoA and then use the energy from um, that hydrolysis in order to drive something. In this case, what we're going to be driving is the formation of our GTP. So before we use that energy in order to basically make a carbon-carbon bond, now we're going to be using that energy to make GTP by adding an inorganic phosphate to GDP to give us GTP. When we do this, um, now we've lost that CoA and formed succinate. So this is going to be our succinate and the step was carried out by succinyl CoA synthetase. Note that for this step, sometimes you'll see like ADP and ATP. There are different enzymes that are used in different levels and different tissues and different organisms that may use may ATP or may make GTP. But when we make GTP, it can be easily interconverted to ATP Basically, there are very similar energetic wise, and so it's not energetically costly, really. You can basically interconvert the different NTPs fairly simply. Now, what we're going to do is basically we need to regenerate our oxaloacetate. In order to do this, we're going to do another um, we're going to do another oxidation step. So this succinate dehydrogenase step, remember this is the step that's actually going to be happening in our inner mitochondrial membrane. This is going to be our complex two. We want it happening in the membrane because it's going, the FAD is going to be um, one of those flavins that's going to be tightly embedded in a protein. So we need that protein to be embedded in the membrane in the place that we want it. By having this reaction here, well, we've got it where we want it. We're generating this FADH2. We need to regenerate the oxaloacetate if we want to redo this cycle. So what we're going to do is we're basically, um, we're going to oxidize it. We're going to form this double bond here. Then we're going to oxidize it. We're going to hydrate it. 
add this OH group, and we're going to oxidize the OH group we just added in order to form a carbonyl, giving us our oxaloacetate. Notice that in this step, we're generating NADH, and in this step, we're generating FADH2. Thinking back to why this might be, well, if we're going from a carbon-carbon single bond to a carbon-carbon double bond, that's going to be harder than going from an alcohol to a ketone. We're going to need a bigger difference in our standard reduction, in our, in our reduction potentials. FAD has a higher reduction potential than NAD+. Basically, what this means is that it's going to want the electrons more than the NAD, and so we're going to get more energy if we give those electrons to FAD than if we were to give them to NAD+. The energy that we get is going to be enough to form this double bond, but it's also going to make it so that we don't have as much energy left over when we go to cash in for um, cash those electrons in for for our ATP generation. And therefore, we're going to have this, only, we're not going to get pumping of protons in our complex too. So we're going to end up with getting fewer, fewer um, ATP generated per molecule of FADH than we do for those NADH, um, for, per FADH2 than we get for those NADHs. Because in the case of our FADH2, here we're not getting the pumping from complex one. We only get six hydrogens pumped. So we only get about one and a half um, proton ATP made because it takes about four protons to make an ATP and we're um, pumping out six. But with NADH, here we're going to be pumping out a full 10. And so 10 divided by four is two and a half. And so that's where you get the two and a half and the one and a half numbers when you think about kind of like the PO ratio. But in the case of why it is, it's because we have lower energy left over because we had this bigger difference in our standard free energies when we reduced the FAD. That was having enough, giving us enough energy to do this double bond formation, but it left us less left over, so we can't use as much to make ATP. But what we've done is we've oxidized this to fumarate, we've hydrated it to malate, then we've reoxidized it to oxaloacetate. So these steps were kind of setting things up to reform our oxaloacetate. And now we can do this cycle yet again. Going back to our idea of when do you lose what? So in the first turn of the cycle, we're going to be losing this carbon dioxide, this CO2. In the second cycle, we're going to be losing this CO2. Both of those CO2s were coming from our oxaloacetate. So the enzyme that makes this, the citrate synthase, the one that joins acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate to give us citrate, it can actually tell these apart. It's kind of sitting in the enzyme's active site in a way that it, you only get this attack from one face. And so you get this stereochemistry such that this the, the carbons that came from our acetyl-CoA are going to be different than the carbons, are, they're going to be recognized as being different than the carbons that were dealt with from the oxaloacetate. And it's this side, these carbon dioxides that we're going to lose. At this point, so if we were label tracing these, we would have that our labels, if we had this like radioactively labeled, our labels would still be up here. They would not be lost in the first step and they would not be lost in the second step. They wouldn't even be, they wouldn't be lost until the second cycle. And to lose both of them, you'd actually kind of have to on net go through two cycle, two more cycles. Why is this? Well, basically what happens is that although at the first step it could tell things apart, once you get to the sustenate step here, this is going to be symmetrical. This, the molecules can't tell apart, so all these carbons, so these carbons are kind of mixed together. If these carbons are mixed together, what this means is that, well, on the next cycle, you're only going to lose half of the one, half of the four that were here, and if they were all scrambled up, well, now what's going to happen is you're going to lose one that was from, on average, you'll lose one that was from the cycle before, and one that was from the cycle two before. So in order to actually get rid of both of those carbons that you brought in, you would have to go through the cycle three times. So if you've heard that you have to go through the cycle three times per acetyl-CoA in order to get rid of both of those carbons, that's what it's talking about. And then remember that you have two acetyl-CoAs per oxygen, per glucose molecule because you had two pyruvates per glucose molecule. So you get two acetyl-CoAs. 
we can keep doing this cycle as long as we keep feeding in acetyl-CoA and we don't take these other things away. But remember, metabolism isn't all about catabolism. It's not just about molecule breaking and it's not just about getting ATP. In fact, what if our cells already have a lot of ATP? We don't want to keep breaking down molecules. Instead, we're going to want to do things like store them up. We're going to we want to build things. We're going to want to anabolize to make molecules. But in order to go and make molecules, we often have to break molecules down a little to get them into smaller parts. And so the, the citric acid cycle is great for this. But once we've got those smaller parts, well, now what are we going to do? We can siphon them out of the pathway in order to make different things. For example, we can make amino acids. We can also do things like we can go and we can make nucleic acids. We can make fats. We can make sterols. We can make our porphyrins, our heme. So different components of the tricarboxylic acid cycle can be siphoned off to make different things, but hopefully you're seeing a problem. If we siphon things out of the pathway, well, now we're not going to have those intermediates in our pathway, so our pathway is going to be halted. What we're going to need is we're going to need anaplerotic reactions. These are reactions that regenerate pathway intermediates. Because it's the cycle, if we are to regenerate one of these components, well, now we'd be regenerating everything that came after it in the cycle. So by feeding in these by feeding in these intermediates at any of these points, we can basically boost our whole cycle. But ultimately, if we want to add more acetyl-CoA in, we're going to need to have oxaloacetate. So we can boost the amount of oxaloacetate we get by either adding it directly or by adding more of one of these upstream things that we can then use to generate this oxaloacetate. In our citric acid cycle, we made oxaloacetate from malate dehydrogenase. So from malate, we transformed it, we oxidized it to form oxaloacetate. But that's not the only way we could form oxaloacetate. And we've actually seen a way that we could form oxaloacetate. And that was as in gluconeogenesis. So when we were making glucose and to go from pyruvate to phosphoenolpyruvate to kind of reverse the last step of glycolysis, we actually did this in two steps. We took pyruvate and we made oxaloacetate with pyruvate carboxylase. And then we used PEP carboxykinase in order to make phosphoenolpyruvate from that oxaloacetate. But first we went through that oxaloacetate. And so if instead of taking this oxaloacetate and making phosphoenolpyruvate, if instead what we did was we took that oxaloacetate and brought it into the tricarboxylic acid cycle, well, now we have a way we can keep this cycle going. So our phosphoenolpyruvate, yeah, we could use it to make glucose, but we could also use it to make oxaloacetate, or we can make, use it to make all sorts of different things like different amino acids. So all of these components are going to then be able to, um, to feed into the, the various pathways. What can get a little tricky is when we think about whether something is anaplerotic or not, whether something is really regenerating pathway intermediates or whether it's just kind of letting the cycle run one more time. If we imagine adding acetyl-CoA, if we just add acetyl-CoA, we, so we need to have something to add it to. We need to have oxaloacetate already present here. If we have oxaloacetate already present here, then we can go through this cycle. But if we were to just add acetyl-CoA, well, it, without the oxaloacetate, the cycle wouldn't be able to function. What if we were to add, however, citrate? Well, if we added citrate, well, now we've kind of bypassed that initial step. We can go through the cycle. We can make oxaloacetate. Then we can join that with our acetyl-CoA, and we can have this cycle go. So if we were to add a component that was already in the cycle, we could get the cycle to keep going. This would be anaplerotic. But if we were to just add acetyl-CoA, well, now we're not going to be able to kind of, this isn't making our pathway keep going if we don't have the components of the pathway already. So this reaction, adding acetyl-CoA, this is not going to be anaplerotic. 
However, pyruvate can be anaplerotic. This pyruvate carboxylase reaction is anaplerotic. We're using it to generate one of the pathway intermediates. We're using it to generate oxaloacetate. We're taking our pyruvate, we're carboxylating it to give us oxaloacetate. This oxaloacetate can now combine with that acetyl-CoA to allow us to go through the citric acid cycle. However, if we didn't have oxaloacetate to begin with, adding acetyl-CoA isn't going to help us out. Furthermore, if we add acetyl-CoA, basically here we're just adding two carbons. Each time we go around the citric acid cycle, we lose two carbons, so we're not regenerating carbons in the cycle. We're kind of just adding what we're going to take out in the future cycles. So that would not be adding carbons to our cycle. That would just be kind of maintaining status quo in a way. On net, we're not regenerating carbons in our cycle. But if we were to add one of these components, we would be. So when we see a reaction that's adding something that's in the citric acid cycle, we're going to call that an anaplerotic um, reaction. But if it's adding something that's not in the cycle, something like acetyl-CoA, this would not be anaplerotic. Similarly, because these things that are in the pathway can go and they can be used to make glucose. So we could take that oxaloacetate and we could use it to make glucose. More technically, the malate gets kind of taken out of the mitochondria, um, changed into oxaloacetate because oxaloacetate can't get through the mitochondrial membrane because basically we want to tightly control the levels of oxaloacetate because those by controlling the levels of oxaloacetate, we can tightly control this pathway, whether it's happening or not. If we were to let oxaloacetate in and out of the mitochondrial matrix willy-nilly, well, that wouldn't be very helpful. And so instead, we're going to tightly regulate it. You might remember if we go back and we think about our malate aspartate shuttle, there we were transforming oxaloacetate to malate in the, um, in the cytoplasm and then back to oxaloacetate or back to, yeah, back to oxaloacetate inside the mitochondrial matrix in order to bring in NAD, um, NADH equivalents. We're able to do this because oxaloacetate, it couldn't just go through the membrane. It couldn't, we, we couldn't even take it through a transporter. Instead, we were taking malate in its place. And so because we tightly, tightly control that oxaloacetate, we're going to be able to, um, to regulate the cycle and things but it's also going to make it so that if we want to use that oxaloacetate that we generate in the cycle, we're actually going to have to remove it as malate, take it into the cytoplasm. There we can transform it to oxaloacetate, and there we can take it further um, to make our to make glucose. But because and because we can go and we can use it to make glucose, we say that if something is in this pathway, we can call it glucogenic. So if we have a component of the citric acid cycle, we could use it to make glucose. We can say that something is glucogenic. This term often comes up when we're talking about amino acid catabolism. When we break down amino acids, some of them we can break down into components of the tricarboxylic acid cycle, and some of them we can't. If we break it down into something that we can feed into the carboxylic acid cycle, then we call it glucogenic. If we can only break it down into something that's not in the cycle already, we can call it ketogenic. Um, or some things are both, and we can call them both glucogenic and ketogenic. When we talk about things that aren't in the cycle, what we're really talking about here is our ketone bodies. In the case of some of our amino acids, such as our um, leucine, lysine, um, phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, isoleucine, these can get broken down into, among other things, acetyl-CoA and acetoacetyl-CoA. If we go and we take oxaloacetate to make glucose, or we take malate, which we then convert to oxaloacetate, basically when we siphon something off of this pathway, we're not going to have oxaloacetate here that can join in with an incoming acetyl-CoA. So even though we can get acetyl-CoA from these Lip, these ketogenic amino acids that can then enter into the pathway, well, they're not going to be able to enter into the pathway unless we actually have oxaloacetate present. If we had taken that oxaloacetate out to go make glucose, we wouldn't have oxaloacetate to join with. And so therefore, on net, we wouldn't be able to, um, to make glucose from that 
amino acid. So yes, it can enter the cycle. And yes, if there's oxaloacetate already present, it could go through and it could be used to make glucose. But by doing so, you're taking out oxaloacetate. And so now you're back to that problem of, well, where's the oxaloacetate coming from? So on net, you're not producing glucose using these ketogenic amino acids. Instead, you have to have stuff already present in the cycle in order for this to work. And in order to actually regenerate the components of the cycle, you need to have it so that you're not taking out more than you're putting in. If, however, you're adding something that's already in the cycle, well, now remember that it's a cycle. So if you add something, even if you add it up here, now it's going to go through here, you make your oxaloacetate. So now you're regenerating any oxaloacetate that you're actually taking out of the pathway. But when you're just adding something that needed something else already here to be the oxaloacetate to be present, even though you can regenerate one oxaloacetate, if you already had oxaloacetate, you're not regenerating oxaloacetate that you take. You're just regenerating the oxaloacetate that you took out. You're not on net making glucose from it. We call these these ketone bodies. These ketone bodies are really great for getting energy from fats and things, as well as for making fats and things. So basically, if we think about our lipids, they're not going to be very water soluble, which makes them great for energy storage in a form that's not going to um, soak up a bunch of water and take up a bunch of space. But it also makes it so that if you want to transport them through the blood, that's going to be difficult. Instead, you can break them down into these smaller pieces that are going to be water soluble and can travel through the body. These include our ketone bodies, our acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone, which can travel to the body um, and then be used, in, taken into cells and used for energy or used for making lipids. But they can't be used to, on net, generate glucose. So these would be lip, um, um, ketogenic, but not glucogenic when we talk about these amino acids. A lot of these amino acids, though, can be used, can be broken down into components of the tricarboxylic acid cycle. In fact, if we say take glutamate, and we were to make the, um, and we were to make the alpha keto form of glutamate, what we would get was alpha ketoglutarate. And if we were to take the, um, we were to take aspartate, and we were to make the alpha keto form of aspartate, we would get oxaloacetate. So those are kind of like our direct ones, but then we can also go through more indirect pathways. Going back to our kind of idea when we were talking about that alpha keto um, dehydrogenation, when we talked about having that kind of E1, E2, E3 complex, similarly to what we had with pyruvate dehydrogenase, in the case of our branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, what it's going to do is it's going to use a very similar mechanism to generate these, um, to do this decarboxylation. And when you do this decarboxylation, you're going to get different products depending on what you start with. And this can be illustrative of our idea of what's anaplerotic um, with, for the TCA. In the case of valine, if we decarboxylate it, we get this, um, we end up with succinyl CoA, which we can then use to make glucose because, well, um, succinyl CoA, it is a component of our tricarboxylic acid cycle. What if we look at leucine? If we decarboxylate leucine, well, now ultimately we end up with the with acetyl CoA. Um, which you can make acetoacetate, acetoacetone, beta-hydroxybutyrate. Basically, we can make our ketone bodies, but we're not making anything that's in our pathway. And therefore, this is going to be ketogenic, but not glucogenic. In the case of our isoleucine, if we break this down, we decarboxylate it. Well, yes, we get some of those ketone bodies, but we also get succinyl CoA. Succinyl CoA, remember, was one of our components of our citric acid cycle, and therefore this would be glucogenic as well as ketogenic. But remember that all of these are interfeeding into these same sorts of pathways. The difference really comes from whether or not that was already a component of this pathway, and therefore you're regenerating a component of the pathway, or you're just feeding more stuff into the pathway, but not ultimately um, letting it keep going. You would need the stuff in the pathway in order to keep the pathway going. 
In addition to controlling the cycle by controlling the levels of the intermediates, we can control the activity of the enzymes. If we think about what enzymes we'd want to control, we want to tightly control the enzymes that were important for those kind of like no-go go, no go sites. Those steps in which we had a very large change in free energy in which it would be hard to go the other direction. Similarly to how we saw that in glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis, the sites of regulation were going to be those key sites at which we kind of had to take different pathways in gluconeogenesis in order to bypass these high energy generating steps. Then a large negative delta G makes it hard to go the other direction. And so instead of regulating directionality by regulating the concentrations, we want to regulate the activity of the enzymes. Let's think about when we would want to go through the citric acid cycle. It's a little confusing with the citric acid cycle because there are times where you would want to go through parts of the citric acid cycle in order to do things um, like build up components because we saw that we could siphon things off in order to make various amino acids, to make lipids, to make nucleic acids. And so, but we actually have like different versions of enzymes and things can get a little complicated. Um, so you can have those sorts of more formational um, citric acid cycle parts of the citric acid cycle going on in places as um, outside of the context of kind of it as a cycle. But if we think of it as a cycle, when we're using it as a cycle, what we're doing is we're generating this NADH, we're generating this FADH2. Yeah, we get that GTP or ATP, but that's going to be, be a small component compared to these electrons that we're drawing out. And so in this cycle, as it goes, if we're not pulling anything away from it, it's going to be considered to be this like cataplorotic, um, this cat, um, catabolic pathway. Where we're breaking things down to get energy. So we're, and we're going to get reducing equivalents. If we have plenty of energy, if we have plenty of reducing equivalents, then we're not gonna want to go down the cycle. So we want to inhibit the key points if we have plenty of ATP, we have plenty of NADH, if we have plenty of the downstream components. On the other side of things, if we don't, if we have a lot of AMP or we have a lot of ADP, but not a lot of ATP, if we have a lot of NAD+, plus, but not a lot of NADH, at those points, we're going to want to activate the pathway. So if we look at those key points where we get those big, big energy changes, this happens when we have those decarboxylation reactions. When we went from our pyruvate to our acetyl-CoA, our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is going to be inhibited by ATP, acetyl-CoA, NADH, and fatty acids. You can imagine that it's helpful to have the fatty acids um, negatively regulating as th this as well, because remember that our acetyl-CoA um, and our, our citrate, our citrate can go and it can be used to make fatty acids. If we have a lot of fatty acids, then we're not going to want to go down this path. Instead, maybe what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to take that pyruvate and we're going to want to take it up through um, pyruvate. We're going to want to go and we're going to want to do gluconeogenesis, say. We're going to want to activate our, instead of activating pyruvate dehydrogenase, we want to activate pyruvate carboxylase and go and make glucose and take that glucose and do glucone um, glyconeogenesis, basically hook that glucose up into storage units. So what we'll see is that this pyruvate dehydrogenase, it's actually going to be regulated by phosphorylation. There's going to be, when it's phosphorylated, it's going to be inactive. So we, act, we can inactivate it by activating this PDH kinase. So if we have plenty of energy, we have plenty of NADH, we have plenty of acetyl-CoA, we're going to activate this kinase. And this kinase is then going to activate this, um, it's going to inactivate pyruvate dehydrogenase, we're going to have less of our acetyl-CoA forms that can then enter the pathway. Once we've entered the pathway, um, well, or that we have less of our acetyl-CoA, and then we have to get that acetyl-CoA into the pathway, which is another step at which we can regulate. Here, we're going to be regulating with the similar sorts of things. And similarly, when we get to isocitrate dehydrogenase, and when we get to alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, these are both two of those steps where we're losing our CO2. Those are going to be our big energy payout steps. And so we're going to want to then um, regulate those steps 
based on the, the availability of downstream components. If we have plenty of downstream components backing up, don't add more stuff in. But if we don't um, have that many, then keep adding things. If we don't have energy, if we don't have NAD+, plus, keep adding things. If we've got plenty of those, stop adding things. If we stop adding things, um, this kind of the signal is then we're building up these intermediates that are then going to travel back up and provide feedback to the top of the line to, hey, let's go do other things with these components. So stepping back to our bigger picture, this idea of cellular respiration is just being kind of like glucose. You take glucose, you go through glycolysis, you take that, you do that pyruvate decarboxylation to give us your um, acetyl-CoA. You take that acetyl-CoA and you enter um, the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You go through the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You go from the, through the electron transport chain and boom, you've got ATP. ATP is far from the other only thing that you might want, and the citric acid cycle makes it a way so that we can make a lot of other things from glucose. But not just glucose, we can make a lot of other things from a lot of other molecules. We can make things from our amino acids. We can make things from lipids. We can make things from nucleic acids. All of this relies on ways we can kind of just interconvert between molecules. We can um, do things. So we have different ways where we can transfer methyl groups, say. So we have ways we can just remove the amino groups from amino acids and get things that are either directly in our tricarboxylic acid cycle or they're components that we can con easily convert into components that are in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. We could take lipids and we could add, we can break them down to give us our acetyl CoA that can go into the pathway. You might be wondering why we say that citrate is used to make lipids, but that lipids come in at acetyl CoA. To understand this, we have to think back to our idea of acetyl CoA being made in the matrix of the mitochondria and not being brought into the mitochondria. Turns out that lipids are broken down inside of our mitochondria through beta, um, through beta oxidation. So lipids are broken down in the mitochondria to give us acetyl-CoA that's already in the mitochondria. And therefore, if we break down lipids, we're going to enter at acetyl-CoA. However, acetyl-CoA can't go through the matrix and so um, through the membrane. Instead, we take it out as citrate. When we take it out as citrate, then once it's in the cytoplasm, it can be converted to acetyl-CoA, which can be used to make lipids, but that's going to be happening in the cytosol and not in the mitochondria. This is similar to how we were kind of bringing out malate instead of oxaloacetate in order to make our glucose. Because that mitochondrial membrane is really, really picky, we're going to not let those, um, those pesky big molecules in and out. And we're also going to regulate this oxaloacetate very tightly. We can take our nucleic acids and we can make components of the pathway. All of these various things that we could do in this tricarboxylic acid cycle that's connecting all of these different pathways. And then there are pathways outside of the carboxylic acid cycle. We can take that glucose and say, go through the pentose phosphate pathway if we need nucleic acids. If we don't have oxygen, we can go through um, lactate fermentation in order to regenerate the NADH to keep glycolysis going in the absence of going through the tricarboxylic acid cycle because, well, you're not going to go through the tricarboxylic acid cycle, carboxylic acid cycle if you don't have some place to put those electrons. If we don't have enough oxygen, say, to keep the electron transport chain going, we're going to be building up our NADH. If we're building up our NADH, but we don't have enough NAD+, well, in that case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be inhibiting our tricarboxylic acid cycle. If we're inhibiting our tricarboxylic acid cycle, it's going to stop. And so instead, if we want to um, keep glycolysis going, if we need to keep making ATP, we're going to have to regenerate that NAD plus in a different way. And this is why our lactate fermentation is going to come into play. Of course, well, now you're basically generating lactate. Um, that lactate, thankfully, can go to your liver, where the liver can convert it back to pyruvate, which can enter the glycolysis, so you can keep things going. Similarly, we could break down other molecules 
So we don't have to just get energy from our glucose. We can also get them from fats. We can get them from nucleic acids. We can get them from proteins. And all of those can feed into the TCA that's going to generate not just all those parts we could use to do make other things, but they're going to generate those reducing equivalents, those NADHs, those FADH2s that we can go and we can use to make our ATP. So in this way, this tricarboxylic acid cycle really is the central hub of a lot of metabolism.